I'm going to talk about uh, computationally efficient learning of uh, Palm DPs. So I work on uh, reinforcement learning. And I'll begin by introducing what this is um, and by contrasting it with uh, some other types of learning that have been studied for a while. So supervised and unsupervised learning uh, describe the problem of prediction based on data from a given or fixed distribution. This includes things like image classification or machine translation. And these types of problems have been studied for a long time. Um, and there's been a lot of theoretical and also empirical work in them. And on the theory side, we've had uh, really wide areas of theory, such as statistical learning theory, which includes um, certain types of complexity measures like the VC dimension, as well as a pretty rich study of computational learning theory. Reinforcement learning is a little bit different from these classical problems in the sense that it describes a problem of actively learning in a dynamic environment. And so what this means is that the distribution of data that you see as a learning agent will depend on past decisions you've made. And this includes problems such as robotics, where a robot has to actively explore its environment and find uh, new directions to explore in, as well as things like healthcare, where you have a patient whose state is changing and you want to make decisions to improve their health over time. And now the analogous theoretical questions that we ask are kind of how many rounds of interaction or how much computation do we need in order to perform a learning task? And this is what I'll talk about. So I'm a theorist, uh, unlike many of the other uh, talks so far. Um, and in order to study these questions from a theoretical standpoint, we need some model to work in. And the model that we use is the model of Markov decision processes, or MDPs. And an MDP consists of a few components. So there's an action set, which describes the set of actions an agent can take. There's a state set, which describes the set of states of the environment. So think of all configurations that a robot can be in. And there's also a transition kernel, which says, given a current state and an action, how do we transition to a new state? Given I'm a robot, I apply a torque to one of my motors, where do I end up next? There's also a reward function, which um, tells us how much reward we receive at a given step um, and a, given an action we take. So what happens in an MDP? There is repeatedly, you're given a state, the agent chooses an action A, the environment then gives the agent a reward, and it also transitions to a new state. And our goal is to maximize the total reward that we receive over many steps of this process. But there's one assumption that I've made here, which is often not true in practice, which is that the agent can see its true state. And in real life, you can't see your true state. A robot doesn't know exactly what its configuration is. It only knows what its sensors tell it. You don't know the full physiological state of a patient. You only see certain measurements, like their blood pressure, or blood work, or other imaging studies. So how do we deal with this from a theoretical standpoint? We modify the model slightly, and in particular consider a POMDP, or a partially observed MDP, which is the same as an MDP, except instead of observing the state, you observe some observation, which is a function of the state. And uh, we interact with the environment in a very similar manner, except that we only see the observation at each step as opposed to the true state. Now, the goal in studying POMDPs is to find a near-optimal policy, which stipulates what action to take as a function of um, the entire history of interaction. And unfortunately, this problem is very, very hard. So there's both computational lower bounds, which say that under certain well-believed complexity theoretic assumptions, it's unlikely that we can find an efficient algorithm. And there's also statistical lower bounds, which say we need exponential samples. What we can do is we can actually prove that there is an efficient learning algorithm under a certain assumption, which says that the observation tells us some sufficient information about the underlying state. And under this assumption, which we call observability, what we can show is that there is a reasonably efficient algorithm that requires a relatively small number of both samples as well as uh, computation, and which can find a near-optimal policy to an unknown observable POMDP. Now, I have 30 seconds, so I can't actually tell you how we prove this, but uh, roughly speaking, the way we do this is we show that short windows of observation suffice to find a near-optimal policy. And this is actually kind of an interesting technique because it has some connection to empirical work, which actually uses this idea of stacking uh, short 
windows of observations. In particular, it's called frame stacking. And this is used and practiced by a lot of people who study these things um, experimentally. So in some sense, our result gives some um, theoretical justification of this frame stacking technique. Uh, that's it. Thank you for listening. In the kinds of POMDPs that people study in, let's say, robotics or in video games and things like that, are the assumptions of the observation function having sufficient information about the state met, or is this a particular assumption you use to, for the theoretical result? Yeah, so it's definitely an assumption that we need for the theoretical result. We can show like lower bounds if it doesn't hold. I think this holds in some settings, um, in particular things where you have very rich information about your environment. Um, you know, the, the, the observations you have will give you sufficient information. Um, but I think there's also other settings, maybe like some of these healthcare settings where you don't have very rich information, where that's not going to be met. And there, like, there's tons of interesting questions, both theoretically and also experimentally. Do you have any suggested ways of changing the exploration in the algorithm to help ensure that it, there's a sufficient information for more types of problems? So I think one way to go about that is actually to use, um, to basically make a slightly weaker assumption than this observability. Um, observability tells you that your single observation tells you information about your state. But you can instead assume that, say, a window of observations tells you information about your state. We don't actually know how to analyze that. That's an uh, open question. But that sort of um, idea where we kind of deal with small observation spaces by making assumptions that involve multiple time steps is an interesting direction for future work. So is there reason to be optimistic or pessimistic about improving the running time to polynomial or maybe even getting some sort of near linear time algorithm that's useful? Uh, there's a lower bound under the exponential time hypothesis, so no. Um, <laughs> We'd have to make a stronger assumption. Uh, we don't know. It's, we've thought a little bit about that. We don't really know a good way of doing it. But unfortunately, this is optimal. Just quickly, the um, the amount, the sort of the level of observability you have. Is there like a threshold at which this works or doesn't, or does it sort of smoothly like how does it scale? Yeah, it scales kind of smoothly. So as long as it's constant, like there's a there's a certain equation that needs to hold with a parameter. As long as that parameter is constant, we can get these quasi-polynomial time algorithms. Once that parameter becomes, say, much smaller, then our algorithm is exponential time, and in fact, that's unimprovable. Thank you so much. This was fantastic.